Let me just let me just start by praying again, if we can. Thank you, Father, for the chance to get to work um, at the school in a so beautifully intertwined ministry and academia. But today we're here for you, and um, I pray that you would help our eyes, the eyes of our heart even, to see what your word says about friendship and, and what true importance there is there and how it probably has very challenging things to say about what friendship is and how we understand that. Pray, God, that you'd prepare our hearts for um, just this time, and uh, you would bless our times of mentor group and that discussion there and continuing to build bonds of, of both fun and um, communion with each other. But most importantly, Lord, I pray that my kids here would see um, Jesus as the supreme friend. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So, <laughs> uh, I'm talking about friendship today, and as I was preparing this message for y'all, it became pretty um, evident that, that God had a connection to be made between what I'm going to share about today and what I shared about last time. Proverbs 17.17 17 reads um, like this, a friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Last time, I focused on that word love, and I want to do a little bit of a recap uh, to, to help connect that message to this one because I think it's important. In that chapel, I focused on the word love, and I explained that being awesome, the being the kind of person that we all want to be at the end of the day, is being a masterfully loving person. It's the highest honor. And we're designed to think that way and to value that kind of person because... God wants us to be looking for the greatest example of, of the person who loved us most, right? The person who had the most glory, Jesus. It's this glory, his honor, his dignity that we're supposed to be looking toward. And it's that same character that I prayed and the teacher pray, uh, teachers continue to pray that would spread across here on campus. So as it turns out, that same verse, we're going to instead focus on the word friend, today, not the word love and what that means. And I, and I feel like it's necessary to address where we are currently, maybe to do like a you know, mini state of the union. Um, and I'm going to start with the negative because I want to end with the positives we've seen here at CVS. But I do want to be honest with you and, and, and hold up maybe a mirror to you here at CVCS of where we are, because there's work to be done. People have approached me asking for prayer regarding the drama that's plaguing them. Conversations we've heard around school have been marked by trash talk, innuendos, while others just sort of stand by and not really saying anything to defend those being harassed. Boys share glances with each other because you believe the cultural lie that sex is a joke, and you share glances at the, at the opportunity to sort of make a connection. All the more, I've seen boys sling words at girls that they think are pretty in some kind of, like, they're, like they, feel like, they feel like they're some, some kind of dating simulator. And the laughter of your, of your compatriots serving as a false sign that your words have had no consequence on that poor young lady. Girls at times have sought to be in the know rather than to be peacemakers, spreading rumors instead of including and getting to know another sister. And both boys and girls have behaved in such a way as to draw attention to yourself um, at the cost of your dignity because it's that cool or attractive person, and you would otherwise feel completely and utterly invisible if you didn't do that thing. There is work to be done. Yet, and here's the positive part, in so many ways, seventh and eighth grade, you have risen to the occasion of what we've wanted to see here in terms of love at CVCS. You have made and collaborated on so many excellent projects, including the <laughs> sock puppet show I'm gonna see for my second period today I'm very much looking forward to. Um, we have uh, seen honest, real, and true conversations happen in my class and I'm sure many others. Seeing you guys make better choices on the playground, like playing soccer and making that adjustment so quickly when Mr. Kloster brought it up has been super encouraging. Seeing you go out of your way to bless me and others with your words, even last time saying such kind things about my dad and me sharing my you know, personal story, just a huge blessing. This is a little anecdote, but yesterday Brooklyn and Aubrey were trying to figure out how to geomet geometrically fit their, the leftovers of their castle into a, they're like trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. It's pretty funny to watch. Um, 
but they, they made a mess, and they didn't even need me to say, hey, can you like go grab a broom and clean this up? They're like, hey, Mr. Ortega, they approached me and said, I need a broom. Help me get a broom, please, you know, right? They did it on their own. Um, what else do we got? So we got uh, Cole Rice and, and Nora and Hunter and others in my class just taking initiative in my class and being adults and taking leadership. It's so cool to watch. Seeing you go out of your way to plan impromptu baby showers for Mrs. Marchand, shout out to fourth period, that was crazy. Like, that's not normal for 13 and 14 and 15, or however you guys are old you guys are, <laughs> 13, 14. Um, that's not normal, I hope you know that, and it's, it's beautiful. Eighth graders, stepping up big time on trips like DC, that Mr. Kloster was telling me, to lead and to like truly handle the power that they've been given um, in eighth grade well. This is all worth celebrating. And I think you should give yourself a round of applause right now. So, that's the good and the ugly, right? Both boys and girls, welcome to being human. That's what it's like. I have been right there with you, and at many times, I, have, I wasn't just 13 and 14 when I did the stupid things that we do sometimes. I've been much older, and we teachers have made the same mistakes and have made much worse mistakes at times. But by God's kindness, we've had the time to attain some wisdom, and some maturity. And so, to speak, uh, to fortify the ways that we look like Christ, I'm here today to talk to you about this. Here's the main idea. You need biblical friendship. You need real friendship. And three points I'll make today with one concluding point is this. I think it's the next slide. Real friendship is found... Real friendship is fastidious. I'll explain it. I know, English teacher, I get it. I'll explain it later. Real friendship is faithful, and real friendship is frustrating. So let's start with the first point, real friendship is found. For this short story, I'd like to, um, I'm going to play for you in a moment, hopefully if I can get this working. And um, it was 2013, I was at a Christian University, CBU, Lance up, hey, um, and trying to make friends wasn't really working out. And part of the reason was I was like, <laughs> I was like 27, 28 at the time, transferring in as a junior, and most of the kids, or kids, most of the adults around me were like, you know, 18 to 21, and it just was a weird age gap. So um, I decided to be a part of the choir and orchestra because I loved music, and I figured, hey, maybe I can find someone just like me in the, in the choir or something, right? As it turns out, I was right that, with that strategy, but it wasn't because I needed someone like me. I needed someone who cared about what I care about, and that's different. That is when I met Sean Gordon. That's the next slide. That's a couple dorks. Um, I met Sean Gordon. I could regale you with many a tale about Sean and I uh, and our dorky adventures, but um, I'll, I'll just save it to this, right? I love that guy, and I still hang out with him to this day. We got to talking after, uh, after choir one day um, about worship music and stuff, and we realized we both had the same passion about something. We started to feed off of each other's, you know, nerdiness and, and our hype for serious, happy, good worship music. And when he came over, it was this song that we realized we were both psyched over that year. Um, and it's a little song called In Tenderness by Citizens. He came over to my little dinky college apartment and stuff, and... Um, I just want to play it for you for a second because I think it was, it's worth sharing and you know why not. In tenderness he sought me Eerie and sick with sin on his shoulders brought me back to his fold again. All angels in his presence sing until the courts of heaven's ring. Oh, the love that sought me. The blood that bought me, oh, the grace that brought me to the fold of God. 
Grace that brought me to the fold of God. That's a little bit of that song. But when we started playing that song together, it was like, whoa, right? It wasn't just like Sean and I looking at each other like, man, you're such a cool dude. Look at you, right? That's not real friendship. Real friendship, my first point, is found. Not that you find another person and you're like, oh my gosh, look at you. It's that when you find another person and you both, like you both meet each other and you turn to see, oh, you're into that too. It's something beyond just you two. And for us, it was this song and what it represents, like good worship music and, and glorifying God in both fun and serious ways, right? That's what did it for us. Boom, our friendship was found. You, two friends must find what they are both walking toward, right? Let's, um, let's look at this passage. It's Proverbs 18, 24, and it reads this. A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer to, uh, than a brother. Two things to point out. Number one, there's a difference excuse me, between a companion and a friend. We can see that from this verse. For example, the simple fact that you all go to the same school here basically makes you all companions. They're all like acquaintances by default. But it doesn't make you what the Bible would call friends yet. And we aren't asking you to treat everyone here at CVCS with this level of friendship. It would literally drive you crazy. It'd be like walking up to see Colby, like, oh, Colby, what are you into? Oh, Sam, what are you into? Oh, you know, like, gosh, you just, you can't do that. It's not what we're designed for. But we have you collaborating with your acquaintances, right, in sock puppet shows and timelines of the Mexican-American War or stuff like that, whatever, right? Because in those little moments where you're sharing a task with someone, you can discover, hey, you're into that thing too, and boom, a real friendship starts. That's why we do that. Second thing to point out. It says, may come to ruin. Ooh. But it's serious, and I, I need to tell you this. In life... You will not make it if you don't have good friends. Bad company corrupts good morals, right? And then in the same way, good friends will make a life. How can I say that? Well, let's look at Genesis, right? Little picture of the Garden of Eve. Do you know that God called something not good before the fall? Like before the whole sin and eating the apple, well, I don't know what fruit it was, but, but, but eating out of the, the tree of good and evil, right? Before that, Adam said, basically, you know what? I feel alone. And God was like, I understand. I'm going to provide you. Now, in this case, right, there, it's a picture of marriage. But in marriage, it's that ache for being, like, having a true and real friend. And so, that's because, you know, we're made in God's image, and, and God is in and of himself a trinity, which means he's a friendship. He's the perfect little, like, group of three friends. Friendship originated in God, and so because we were made to be like him, we crave friendship. And so, where should you find these friends? Uh, and, and I just wanted to share, for me, when I was in junior high, <clears throat> I, little, I was struggling with um, just feeling like I didn't have a ton of friends and things like that. Uh, and it's for a number of reasons, maybe because I was awkward or whatever, I don't know. Um, but I literally, I talked to my counselor because my family valued counseling quite a bit, which I can uh, recommend to you. And I told them I didn't feel like I had any friends, and she told me this, my counselor told me this, you seem to want a level of friendship <clears throat> that isn't being offered at the tiny little school that you go to, and I was very small. Instead of trying to find friendship at your small school, try to find friends with people at your church's youth group because you're all after something greater than yourself. So we ask if you've been to church, not to just sort of shame you and be like, how dare you not go to church? You're such a bad kid, right? But because for there, um, we, we want to invite you into finding real lifelong friends because I still have friends from my junior high youth group to this day. Because if you're rallying around with your friend group something that's like weak or strong, like remember when I said when you find friendship, if that thing that you're looking toward isn't really like strong or it's just wrong, the book of Proverbs says it will wring the life out of you. Simply and only playing video games together is a weak foundation for friendship. It's not a bad thing, but if it's the only thing that makes your friendship a friendship, it's weak. 
I've, uh, playing video games should serve as a way to, to rest you somehow into getting back into the front lines of a greater passion with your, with your friend group. I've given your mentor group leaders questions, and this is, this is a worthy um, question of brainstorming and asking your, each other, what are healthy passions you can have as friends um, in that good discussion? So with the power friends have on our lives, let's look at the next point. Real friendship is fastidious. Real friendship is fastidious. I'll get to what that means in a second. When I was younger, I had a friend um, who, for, th for the sake of privacy, I'll call Lopez. He moved away from Utah to escape the oppression of Mormonism, and we met at my old church. <laughs> I'll never forget, like, he, he was at a Christian church for the first time, and the, he was just totally glazed over, like, like a deer in, in headlights. He was like, what the heck did I just experience? He was so freaked out. God soon saved him after, thank God, and the process started of him becoming more like Jesus. He became like a brother to me. We were roommates, roommates, and I walked through his issues of depression, dealing with abuse from his past and his family, uh, and enduring a very messy breakup. His sadness was so deep, and it was almost too late for me to realize just how deep his pain was. Things got worse. Um, he started to sort of isolate and stuff, and um, in the next slide, before I knew it, uh, I was on Facebook, and Facebook was more of a thing at the time, and I saw him post really strange and angry and scary things online. And then uh, I got a call. He was at the psych ward, um, about to be checked in because what I had learned is that his self-harm had almost led to his death. Um, I was devastated. From that point on, um, I realized the importance of this word fastidious and what it means is that once you have that foundation in your friendship of you both see each other and you realize you're walking toward the same thing, that's just the start. You have to be fastidious, which means you have to be careful, thoughtful, and intentional with what you say and what you know about the other person. Because for me, I had missed some of the red flags in my friend's life that it kind of led them to this drastic point. And I regret that. I almost lost him. Proverbs um, in chapter 26 reads a, a few things. Whoever sings songs to a heavy heart is like one who takes off a garment on a cold day and like vinegar on soda. Like a madman who throws firebrands, arrows, and death is the man who deceives his neighbor and says, oh, I'm only joking. It says, whoever sings songs to a heavy heart, and it actually kind of sounds like a positive thing, but it's not. The word for songs there is like a joyful song. So it would basically be like you singing, you know, a Taylor Swift love song to someone who just got rejected by their, like, mega crush. They're like, oh, man, they don't like me. You know, and you're singing, I don't know, right, Maddie can help me out with that later. Um, and taking, or, or it's like taking pride in being the friend who goes too far in what you say, and like or being pr proud of your, like, clapbacks and your... Um, whatever response that you have. And I hope you see, by the way, like with words like clapback, the way that our, our slang kind of sugarcoats us being a jerk sometimes, it makes it sound better, like, oh man, I'm gonna give a clapback, boom! Like, that, that sounds funny, but in reality, unless you really build a trust with the friendship and you know that person where they're coming from, you, don't, you, you shouldn't ever be to the point where you're, where you're teasing. Because most of the time what happens is you don't really know that person. You say something. It could really, really damage. It could really even be like, well, shooting a fiery arrow at their house. And you don't even know. That's what the, the Proverbs say about this kind of stuff. And so real friendship carefully takes the time to know the other so that you can have fun and you can build each other up at the end of the day. God has helped Lopez and I to both speak the truth with love into each other's lives to the point where he's helped improve my marriage. And I, by God's grace, have spoken words of life to him, helping him reject lies that others have put on him. Finally, real friendship is faithful. That's our third main point. Real friendship is faithful. The friends that I have still to this day from my youth group and stuff um, have this in common. They've pushed into my life when it was inconvenient for them. They didn't just be like, wow, 
Rick has a pretty sweet pad. He's got a jacuzzi. He, uh, I don't know, I like the look of his, the gleam off of his head. You know, let's go hang out with Rick, right? They didn't ask any selfish questions like that. Um, when I was dating a friend in Sean Gorton's friend group, we broke up eventually with, with that girl. And it was my friend Josh that after that went out of his way and made the effort to ask, hey, man, do you want to come over and like play games and hang out and talk and stuff? He didn't let the awkwardness of that breakup in that friend group, and we all know how awkward a breakup, like literally in class the other day, we had this discussion on what it feels like to be stuck in between the two groups um, of people. And the kids said like, what the most awkward thing is that it feels like you have to be on a certain team. And that's what was true in this group. But Josh didn't care about any of that. He's like, man, come here, I love you, I get it. And one last story I'll share is this. Um, it was a night, after my dad passed away and my aunt was consoling my mom. In the chaos of everything, I didn't even know what to do, but um, I got a call from my then girlfriend at the time, now my now wife, Sarah. And in my darkest hour, she pushed into my world in the most uncomfortable space for her to do something that was at a cost to herself, but to bless me. And do you know what that call said? She told me, for the first time in our relationship. You know, Ricky, I just, I don't even know what to say, and I don't even care if you love me back, but I need to tell you something. I love you. And I, you can, you can, like, whatever you need, I'm here for you, not because I'm your girlfriend or not because whatever, but, but basically what she was saying is, I need to tell you that I love you, and I'm committed to being your friend no matter what. She was there. That was one of the things that, I mean, made me want to marry her, but like, but, but the core part of even our marriage today is the friendship part. It's not all the, the mushy-gushy stuff. Because we need friendship. A friend loves at all times. That's what that beginning verse said. And so, I hope you feel the weight um, of the amount of work it takes to be a real friend. It is going to the fourth F, right? Frustrating. It's hard. It takes work. We have a a nature that wants to make most of ourselves and not of our friends, I get it. You have to fight what our culture tells you about what everyone else in your life is an NPC and you are the main character, right? I know it's kind of funny, but like, that's the way our culture wants to make you at the throne of your own life instead of others and Jesus. All these people I talked about are friends of mine because they acted like real friends and they became real friends, right? And you may need to analyze why you don't have this level of friendship. It could be because people don't feel safe around you. Maybe don't, they, don't, they don't feel safe around your you know, words and stuff. Perhaps people know you're just waiting for an opportunity to make fun of them. Maybe you only ever insist on talking about the things that you're interested in. You have to ask yourself, when was the last time you asked a sincere question about something someone else was interested in? But don't worry. That's where the message of Jesus shines in our last line. He went out of his way to become a human like us so he could relate to how we feel. He was not human, but he became human. He went to find us first. He is the fastidious one, careful to have never sinned, experiencing all the range of emotions in our life so that uh, he would be able to understand what we truly feel and relate to us. He is the faithful one, enduring literal hell to save us and remains with us when we call on him for help, always. He never leaves us, even in our sin. And so as long as you breathe, you can still have access to Jesus. When you have Jesus, he will, and trust me on this, because he's done this for me, he's done this for all the adults here, he will guide you to have true friends. And he will make you a true friend. Life, with, life is about walking with the eternal friend, Jesus. Please pray with me. Thank you, Father, for this look at um, friendship and what the Proverbs have to say. I pray that you would free my, just, man, these, free these boys and girls up to not be chasing the, the attention or the sort of like um, the affirmation of literally everybody at the school, but to see how worth it it is to invest in a smaller crowd and learn how to treat companions, learn how to treat acquaintances with kindness, you know, and with, with gentleness and stuff. But treat them and teach them, Lord, to value what it is the Bible really calls friendship and how it can last forever. 
Um, work on their hearts through, through the Spirit, I pray, and, and draw them to yourself. In Jesus' name, amen. This episode has been a production of the Capistrano Valley Christian Schools Podcast Network. Capistrano Valley Christian Schools is a Christian JK-12 school in San Juan Capistrano, California. Be sure to check out, subscribe to, and leave a review of this show and the other shows on our network on your podcast player of choice. Doing so supports the school community in a multitude of ways. For more information about the CVCS Podcast Network or any of our other shows, check out cvcs.org or email podcasts at cvcs.org. On behalf of the whole network, this is Mr. Jasper saying thank you again for listening and stay tuned for more.